Hello, welcome, and assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Farooq Khawais. I drive sales and business developments at a tier one telecom vendor working towards the 5G telecom operators in the US driving sales and business development. Uh, I am very privileged today to uh, welcome Arya Satya Dharma to uh, the panel. Uh, Arya is my good friend and classmate at, uh, from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. We did our executive MBA together. Um, Arya is CEO of a venture capital firm in Indonesia. It's called uh, Parya Satya Dewi Dharma. Uh, his firm has invested in more than 100 companies and startups between Indonesia, Southeast Asia, and the United States. Um, Arya, uh, welcome on board. Uh, really uh, excited to have you here today with us. What we are trying to achieve today is talk about not just uh, Arya's journey uh, from an operator to a VC, uh, but also understand the current startup landscape in Indonesia. And then we would uh, see how we can draw some parallels with the current Pakistani tech ecosystem and hopefully learn a uh, few good lessons that can be applied for the Pakistani entrepreneurial ecosystem and the investments that are coming in. Uh, Arya, would you like to uh, start uh, by giving more of your, your introduction and maybe share the slides that you have? Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Farooq, for having me. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure knowing you as well. It's, you know, as, as friends, as classmates and everything. And then now with this, it's amazing. So let me just start with the By the way, while Arya is setting up, you, this, this building that you see in the background is where Arya and I spent uh, a great summer uh, about two years ago in Hong Kong when we were together at, uh, at the University of Chicago's uh, campus there. So some great memories. That's why I, I specifically made sure that I, I bring this, uh, this background here to uh, uh, you know, reinitiate re those memories. So back to you, Arya. Thank you, thank you for it. So yeah, let me start with this. I'm just gonna talk about the initial start of startup like landscape and a bit about Southeast Asia in, in general. So in this data uh, what I'm gonna talk about is before 2021. So how many Southeast Asia startups have successful funding in the last 10 years? About 2,889, of course, give and take, right? But then how many Southeast Asia startups have made successful exits in the last 10 years? 80. How many of them actually made a million dollar exits? Just a second. So only two. And those two are, one is Lazada, uh, which was acquired by Alibaba in 2016. Valuation was 1.5 billion. And C, C actually IPO in the US, valuation at IPO 4.77 billion. So this is like this uh, summary of the journey of everyone in Southeast Asia from uh, the first fund financing around until the exit. If you see the exit in, in the billion dollar, it's only two exits so far. And I, I guess it's, um, this is good to know, right? Because uh, we know that we're facing, so we were facing a, a great, great odds of um, making a billion dollar asset. So based on the data on only 0.07% of Southeast Asian startups made successful assets in billion dollar valuation. So it is, it is really a, a, a great challenge even in Southeast Asia. But 2021 is really the year for tech ecosystem, especially for Indonesia, because um, as you know, the Indonesian e-commerce landscape right now is we have about we have four major, so Bukalapak, Tokopedia, Lazada, and Shopee. 
as you seen earlier, Shopee is part of the C group, which made exit at the IPO, and Lazada is right now owned by Alibaba. And um, the two, two contending one from Indonesia are actually Tokopedia and Bukalapak. And you'll see more about each of them soon. So Bukalapak, they're about to go IPO this August, and they're gonna raise 1.5 billion, which I think is already done. And the valuation after the IPO is, would be 6 billion. So it's still rather small if you compare it to, to the US, you know. So I have a problem with this. And Gojek and Tokopedia, yeah, if you don't know Gojek, Gojek is like the right hailing app in Indonesia. You just merged with Tokopedia last May. And the combined population is said to be 17 billion. And uh, the word on the street, go, go, so the, the combined entity is called Goto. Goto, they're looking to, to do, do, do this thing in NASDAQ and also in Indonesia stock exchange. So um, they're talking to some people in, to do the same IPO as well. So this is a bit of my, myself. I got my, uh, my bachelor and master's from the University in National Engineering. I'm also ethics certified, I was, and, and then I co-founded my, my company, Pasitea Group, which is the Connex Industry, and Ferdanko Group, my support industry. And I started angel investing since 2011. I started investment more in the, more, uh, more properly in 2013. And right now, as, as Ferg mentioned, I'm getting my SOPMJ program degree at Chicago Booth. So these are just some, some of my investments so far. Uh, I don't know if you know any of the, the names. Probably you've heard of Kata Book in India, and also I don't know if you know the Centro in India as well. And Aspire is is a pretty big one also in, in Singapore, and in Indonesia right now one of the biggest one is uh, Bukukas. So just a bit of story of how I started in in tech industry is in 2011 I started with some of my friends, a food delivery startup. Um, some of my friends actually ran the, the, the company and um, I positioned myself as more of an angel investor. And it was one of the first online food deliveries in Indonesia. But back then, uh, the, the, the ordering and everything is still, still done um, website because back then we don't have a smartphone ready to available. And we got a we got up to 100 daily orders by 2015, and we also raised PC funding from Spiral Ventures, and um, there's a company, Humano Machi, also, as well, invested in us, and then we eventually sold to, to that company with a 5x exit in 2015. And if you know Gojek, Gojek launched their Google Food in 2015. So in a way, it was a good timing as well for us to exit. So I guess um, in the like your system is also good to know when when to exit as well. So what I learned from the cricket cricket experience was that timing is really important because back then, 100% of our orders came from our website, and from 2015 till now, GoFood order are 100% from mobile app. So I think. Timing, why, why timing is important? Because you have to know the catalyst, right? The catalyst of what will make the, that startup works, right? So for example, let's say um, these days in Indonesia, there are so many of the API base, you know, that, that wants to do KYC, you know, verification and everything is because the, the ecosystem of the FinTech is already there, right? So I think we, we need to know where the, market is and what are the, the needs of the ecosystem as well. So the second thing was that customer behaviors data must be leveraged. Back then, we didn't really leverage data, you know, what came just go just like that. And, and basically the, the, the order of data didn't really, uh, we didn't really use it in our advantage. So I think that was, my second learning and the third one was that scalability is important. Back then we deliver everything with our own fleet. 
which probably is scalable in a way, but you need a lot of investment, right? Uh, meanwhile, a Gojek deliver everything without their fleet, right? So the fleets are, are all these uh, freelancers, basically like freelancers, just like Uber, right? Um, so imagine right now Uber, Uber Eats, back then, uh, basically GoFood is like Uber Eats, but deliver with a motorcycle. So what I would suggest, you know, if, if you're in Pakistan or, or the US or wherever you are, I think you need to see what works up elsewhere, right? So what I, yeah, I mean, I, I invested in Katabuk, so I saw it firsthand what was happening in Katabuk in India. And which is why when Gukas came along and of course, great founder, you know, and also the, the market was ready. And when I compared the two between Indonesia and, and India, there was a lot of similarities, right? Just like what you're, what you're thinking right now, there are a lot of similarities between Indonesia and, and, and Pakistan. And I think, yeah, I mean, Pakistan is the uh, fourth, wait, fifth, right? The fifth biggest uh, after Indonesia, right? In terms of population. So, and the population is, is not that far behind of Indonesia. So I think there are so many similarities but I think you need to dig deeper. I'm sure you would probably know better about Pakistan. Uh, for example, let's say uh, the, the GDP per capita of the, the capital or GDP per capita of the tier one cities, tier two cities, tier two cities, how different are they? You know. So I think in, in, for Indonesia, we're just quite similar with India where the tier one cities are probably like up, up here, but tier two, tier three are not uh, up pretty far behind. So when I look at the, the plate model and plate model, you know, the, the open banking, right? Um, being deployed in, in India with the, the, the central, I started to think as well that, that it's just a matter of time that um, Indonesia will experience the same. And not actually not too far behind, actually just like a couple of months after I came across the central, um, someone came to me and, and wanted to build Brick API. And because I think that right now the FinTech ecosystem is, is already maturing and, and actually going really fast, um, I also invested in Brick. So I think this is like one of my last uh, presentation. Uh, so yeah, this is just an Indonesian startup line. And, and um, what I wanna, of course, is, is not everything is here, but what I saw as being in, on the ground, what I saw was like the, the, the main theme is, for example, let's say from 2009, 2015, is like e-commerce and right hailing, you know, and it, it, it's Tokopedia, Bukalapak, uh, Gojek, and then also Grab came in. And then 2016, 2018, it was more of the FinTech, you know, lending, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, yeah, so like peer to peer lending and, and, and trying to build a banking and banking API. Uh, so a lot of, basically a lot of things that, that has to do with FinTech. And um, towards the 2019, 2020, what I saw was that there were more of the online to offline. And and, and this is not just the, the new startup as well, you know, like, of course, like the, the logistic is also part of it, you know, trying to empower this, this mom and pop shops and supply chain, you know, from, from the, from the uh, e-commerce to the, the mom and pop shops. And now you have from the C to the table startups, you know, trying to digitize the, you know, from the, the what do you call it? Uh, from basically the C producer, producer and also from the farm producer, you know, so from, from the farm to table as well. So what I've seen is that there are many of these online to offline and then offline to offline as well. And 2021 onwards, uh, I would probably think that there will be more of the API games, you know, API startups that want to capture this verification, you know, um, because like you already have the FinTech e-commerce and everything logistic they're ready to 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 be integrated together so 
you would see a lot of collaboration between them and, and, and these API startups can really uh, captures a lot of uh, that market. So yeah, that's a, a brief. I would hope that is enough. And, and yeah, Farouk, let, I'll give it back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Arya. So let's have a few, a few questions that I would like to ask you and then we can start um, also taking questions from the chat box here. I see Farooq has already shared one question here. So Farooq, I'll, I'll come to your question in a, in a bit here. So Arya, one question that comes to mind is that you have invested in more than 100 uh, companies thus far. What kind of um, checks and balances or filtering process that your com specific company goes through, given the fact that the information may not be available or it may be asymmetrical. I mean, you, you cannot just go to pitch book and just look at data for all the startups which are uh, working privately and, and get all the information that you need. So what have been your specific learnings in, in that regard? Yeah, yeah. So I would say because like we, we invest in a lot of the early stage startups, we need to know the founders really well as well, you know, because uh, usually what we do is like we do background check of the founders, right? Where they worked before, uh, what they did before, if like they were founders before, um, what happened to the startup, you know? Was there problems between co-founders or, or is just that they run out of money or whatever, you know? So I, I guess we need to know what they did before because in the beginning, it's really about the founders. My, I would say my biggest learning throughout my, my journey is that you don't invest in the product that they present because when they, when they came to us, they would bring up a product, right? But the thing is, just in like six months or so, the product would change. You know, they improve a lot, right? They, they improve the product a lot. So you don't invest in the product, the, the, that existing product. You want to invest in, in, a, in a founder that, uh, of course, the background matters as well, but also the founders that, that are willing to like take that uh, step to achieve something that, you know, like really big, right? So you, you get, you're you gonna have a big vision because you're not gonna just be there, be there for, for like two, three years, you know, it's, it's, it's for the long haul. Thank you for so much for that uh, answer. Now, building on the same answer, uh, uh, question, um, if you see any shortcomings in, uh, in, in founders, uh, have you been able to invest in companies where you can bring in a few operators from outside? Do you think that's kind of a model that can be implemented in emerging markets? So actually, one of my startups closed down when the founder just says, yeah, I give up, you know. And I tried to do that, you know, try to bring in operators, but it was really tough, you know, because the, the founder still controls majority of the, the, the company. And basically you need his support, right? Without his support, it would not work, right? So I think being in a very early stage, it's really hard when, when you're not really backing the founders. And, and I think uh, you, can, you can actually definitely do that, you know, at some point, for example, it's in Bukalapak. Bukalapak has been around for, for like 10 years, I think. And, and about probably two years ago, they changed their leadership and new CEO, new president came in. So uh, then the founders right now are not in the company anymore. I mean, they still own the stock, but the founders left the company. So I think once you reach that, that maturity where the organization structure is there, I think you will, you're going to be able to replace the founders. But in the beginning, just like when where we invested so far, I think it's really tough if you want to replace the founders. One question that comes to mind, uh, Arya, is um, 
your experience with Kata Book in India. Could you elaborate more on how you found about the opportunity, what sort of channels or platform you used to connect with the Indian entrepreneurs? And how was that entire journey for you right from when you got to know about the opportunity to when you invested? So the opportunity came because I went to Y Combinator Limule, uh, in Southern Valley. Um, when I went there, I, I, I saw the pitch and it was not a, basically the product was not the same like that, right? Um, but when I met the founders, we had like a 15 minute uh, chat and everything. It's the founder had a problem in the, in the past with the, with the previous startup, housing.com. And he was very candid about it. He told his side of the story. And I think that that plays into you know, part of, of why I was interested because he was very open of why Housing.com failed and basically his, his, his plan for, for Katabu. All right. So basically uh, the Y Combinator Accelerator was uh, the path that you followed when you uh, uh, learned about this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So a question, my last question before I start asking a uh, few the questions uh, from, from the chat here, and then I'll interject my questions later, uh, is that have you ever uh, been aware of the Pakistani entrepreneurial system, given where you are in Indonesia? Have you ever heard about uh, Pakistan's ecosystem? Uh, has there ever been any talk about it? Um, to be honest, not yet. And it's not that I'm not interested, it's just that it's beyond my reach, right? I mean, um, my team is very small, so well, we cover Indonesia most of the time. For Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian investment, mostly it's, it's the ones graduated from from accelerators. So, so in Singapore, you would have Entrepreneur First, Antler, SOSV, and, and the likes. And even the the ones in, in India are are the ones graduated from Y Combinator. So the Centro also graduated from Y Combinator. So uh, it, it's hard for me to, to try to source deals in, 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 even in India and, and not alone in Pakistan. So, uh, so far not yet, but I know it's, it's the next biggest population in the world. So uh, I would say it's gonna be interesting coming, coming up soon. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, Pakistani ecosystem, of course, is uh, growing. And like I have recently shared with you, the stats that this year probably would hopefully be the number one year in terms of investments coming in. So we'll, we'll discuss more offline, um, you know, about, about the opportunities in Pakistan. And then I'll also have Ali reach out to you separately. Uh, let's start with Farooq's first question first. Um, he asks, how independent is the Indonesian VC ecosystem? I think by independence, he mean if it's uh, if if there is any um, sort of consortium or uh, uh, you know that that helps with the investments, I um, and or syndication maybe. And then he also asks, how does the region play a part for uh, from LPs to deal flow and recruiting? Um, all the way to uh, basically successful exits. And then what kind of uh, lessons can the Pakistan ecosystem um, learn from, from Indonesia? So um, I don't understand exactly what, what the independent, uh, he, what, what he meant by independent in, for the PC, but I would say that the, the trend of the PC in the beginning, like early 2000, 2010 or so, um, there were a lot of foreign PC, you know, Japanese PC, you know, in, and, and even from Singapore. And when that started the the movement, right, uh, a lot of the local players got interested as well. But I would say that that a lot of the even the local PCs are the ones who have access to foreign money as well, because telling you know, telling high net worth Indonesians uh, saying that, hey, you need to invest in the ecosystem. Back then, it was not 
interesting at all. You know, we didn't have the Bukalapak, the, the go to that we're about to go IPO as well. You know, back then was nothing. So uh, when, 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 even when I mentioned it to a couple of my friends that I'm starting to invest in, in, in tech startups, uh, they don't see it as, as a, you know, something that's interesting because we just don't see a lot of successful, uh, like proven story yet in Indonesia. But I think it's, it's a matter of, um, of believing in the ecosystem, right? Because I saw the trend that, the reason why I started investing in Indonesia is because I saw the trend in, 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 in India, you know. Actually, India was, was the reason why I started investing in Indonesia. Because uh, before India was China, and then, of course, China followed the US, you know. And back in 2014, 15, the top five market cap in, in, in in the U.S. were early tech companies, and the top ten or so in, in China were or like majority of them probably um, uh, tech companies, and and India, if I'm not mistaken, was like one or two in, in, the, in the tech uh, in the stock market. But the, I guess Japan or at least saw the, the growth of tech companies, you know, in, in Japan and, and and China with SoftBank and the likes. So I think they were aggressive coming into Indonesia. They were one of the first ones in, in, in the in Indonesia. And I think that was good. And, and, and I'm not saying that I don't trust the Indonesian PCs, but uh, having that validation by, by foreign PCs also uh, uh, made it faster for, for, for everyone in the ecosystem. It certainly does. We, we recently had um, a syndication with Kleiner Birkins in Pakistan for uh, one of the uh, new startups that I send you some details about, and that is brewing a lot of good uh, visibility. Um, I'll club a few questions here. One from Zulfikar at Cargo Tech, Ali Fahad and Asim Qureshi, they are asking uh, about the type of businesses you invested, invest in and the, the normal ticket size per investment. Yeah. So the the what i invested in the past and now it is kind of like evolving as well so in the beginning i started looking a lot of the, the b2b SaaS companies because that's what i understand right and and some of them um made it pretty well as well but i would say none of them reached the the billion dollar you know valuation or even like 500 million valuation like they reach probably 150 you know 200 but the the type of companies that i invested you know the SaaS. i think the what i learned was that the market of course the, basically the timing the timing was not right of course you would have the the, the big cities users you know companies in big cities would probably use SaaS. But when you go deeper into the tier two, tier three, uh, they would not use the SaaS, right? So I guess that really shrunk the, the, what, what we thought was the, the market size. So I think before investing in, in SaaS, you would probably want to know how big the market is and, and deeper uh, on that matter because um, that was my, my I, I'm not, I'm not going to say that it's, it's, a, it's a regret because it also, um, it was a learning process as well for, for myself. And my ticket size uh, before the COVID, it was like 50 to 100, but now it's uh, just average to 50. And um, right now we try to invest in a lot of the, the, the what we call like e-commerce enabler, you know, logistic enabler, whatever that try to support the, the, the real, um, market you know because of course e-commerce is big but i think a lot of the o2o startups really want to support the real economy right and and investing in companies that support those companies will help us as well because uh, a lot of money are coming in in, in logistics you know and, and um supply chain startups and everything so uh, finding companies that support them will definitely help uh, as well. Thank you. Um, 
I have a question, but I'll ask it after uh, Amir's question here. And his question is, an interesting one is that if you have to give a two minute speech on why Indonesia, what would be that pitch? Um, and I think the reason why he's asking is this question is that how can uh, we uh, Pakistanis learn from, from that sort of a pitch when we are speaking with our friends or colleagues or investors from outside of Pakistan? Hmm. <laughs> I was not prepared for this, but I, probably I would say that um, Indonesia has a young demographic and, and people are saying, a lot of investors are saying that, that this will be a, 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 a plus you know, demographic for, for the next 15, 20 years, because the young demographic will, will in terms in terms of become the, the, the ones working you know, and, and generating a lot of the, the productivity. So if that's the, also the case in Pakistan, then that will be a very, very good indication because once this young demography will become the, the ones generating the production and everything, basically increase the GDP per capita, that will, um, so for example, for Indonesia, the GDP per capita, the inflection point was 4,000 USD. That's when, when um, uh, people who were actually saving start to spend more. So I think we've reached that inflection point. So if I, if you need me to sell about Indonesia, is because right now the consumer market is, is is booming, and of course there was some setback from from the, the COVID, but uh, we're still there. Thank you. Yeah, I think Pakistan also has a very budding uh, young population. And uh, uh, I, I'll share some stats with you later uh, on that note. Um, so uh, Amir also asked a side question um, that, have you seen a trend where Indonesians from outside of the country are returning back and starting startups in Indonesia? Maybe maybe they, they went abroad or they were abroad for a long time studying or working and, and now you're seeing a trend of them returning and uh, starting new businesses in the country? Yeah, yeah, so I think that's uh, what um, some people call sea turtles, you know, because you know, you have got turtles coming back to China and we have the sea turtles, you know, Southeast Asian turtles coming back from, from Europe, from, from US and then start something in Indonesia because my someone say Gojek, was founded by uh, someone who went to Harvard Business School, you know, and then uh, Traveloka uh, was founded by someone actually went to my university, Purdue University. So a lot of the the, the uh, unicorns are actually founded by uh, someone who came from abroad, except uh, Tokopedia. Tokopedia was founded by someone who graduated from local school, and that's why he's like the local champion and everything. So definitely, we we we've seen a mix. We've seen a mix of of someone coming back, coming back from from the U.S. as well. And there was actually one. Uh, there's an actually right right now one one venture capital that is trying to focus on finding those people coming back from U.S. and want to start something in Indonesia, because uh, their thesis is that most of the the the, the unicorns in in Southeast Asia and in uh, in general are founded by by someone who has a uh, MBA degree or master's degree from, from US. Um, I, I, it's not like, I, I don't agree with that, but I mean, like that's their thesis. No, but I think it's important to have a uh, local experience amongst in the mix because so, somebody needs to understand and be able to hustle through the local system. And if you have a team which is completely uh, coming from abroad, with not any experience or any life experience for that matter in the country, then it becomes a little dif difficult. Yeah, I I, agree. I totally agree with that because I think someone who just came back from overseas, you know, would not understand the, the life of the people in, let's say, in Sulawesi or, or in, 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 in Bali or in Sumatra or in Kalimantan. Whereas if you're already back here or you go to school here, you might have been, you know, there for, for work for you know whatever uh, at least you're already exposed to the different uh, types of economies because I 
I would say Jakarta is a metropolitan, but it's totally different, you know. Um, for example, I say in Jakarta, the GDP per capita is about uh, 20, 20,000, right? And your GDP per capita in the uh, other, other part of the, let's say Kalimantan is about 80, sorry, sorry, 8,000, you know? So, and, and we're talking about the minimum wage right now per month is about $250, you know? So uh, you got to understand the, 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 that what works in Jakarta might not work in other part of the country, right? So it's not a, it's not a one uh, place where you have 280 people, 280 million people where when, when you are successful in, in grabbing some is replicable in everywhere. So I think knowing that, you know, the, the how fragmented we are is really important. And I think I'm sure uh, Pakistan is also the same where you have different uh, tiers of the cities. No, it's, it, it, it certainly uh, there are a few cities who can which, which can be considered tier one with a population of at least uh, uh, close to 10 million and even more. And then there are a few which fall into the tier two. And uh, we can discuss that more later. Uh, Ms. Zaka asked a question um, that what's the percentage of women-led startups that you have funded or for that matter have been funded in Indonesia? In, in, in totality in Indonesia in the last one year? Uh, I don't have the data. Um, in, in my portfolio, it's about 15%. Yeah. And, and yeah, it, it's not like I don't want to invest in them. It's just that, you know, the, the amount of, of companies that are uh, uh, founded by, by female founders are, are not that many so far. Um, and I think we have to understand the culture of Indonesia as well, where, um, where you know, there's that stereotypical where, where women should, should uh, take care of the, the, the child and everything. And a lot of the, the, the this career-minded uh, women ended up, you know, um, just quit their job and, and, and be a housewife. So I think, um, it's not like I'm saying it's it's great, but but I think we we need to improve that. Of course, I believe that. No, certainly, certainly. And uh, Fatma is just saying that it's uh, fifteen percent is great. Uh, in Pakistan, we are we are at, uh, very low end there at around three percent. But I think there's a need to uh, focus on diversity and inclusion, and having more women participate in the ecosystem for sure. Uh, and, and one, one, one thing that comes to mind, Arya, is that we, we had this conversation many times in uh, Prof Professor Richard Taylor's class uh, behavior, on behavioral economics and behavioral psychology on when to pull a trigger and when not to pull a trigger. So Salman Khalid asks uh, a very uh, timely question is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of money and dry powder right now available. And uh, the valuations have been skyrocketing uh, for these early stage startups. Um, and in many ways, you know, it's just a hand wave, you know, when it comes to the valuation and, and the prospects. So as an investor, when do you decide to stay in the game and when do you decide to walk away? When you say walk away, meaning not to invest? In not to invest, capital. yes. Um, you know, there are a lot of probably like founders who think that they're the only one, you know, doing it and not really looking out there and, and see where the competitors are, are, you know, because they would think that there is so unique that no one else will be their competitor, you know. Um, so I think that's when, and when right flag like for me because you would have indirect competitors, right? Or, or potential com competitors coming in. And so uh, that's, that will be one of my red flags when, when they, they're not really uh, looking out there and trying to, to see the, the competitive landscape. 
Um, the second thing that I would say the biggest red flag is when they fake it till you make it kind of, you know, model where um, basically they fake the numbers and and fake the the metrics where, for example, let's say they they say that. Uh, left capture number of users, but actually, and uh, those users are actually, for example, say friends and families, you know, not really uh, real users, and um, those users users are not really the quality users where they actually use the app or use the software regularly. Um, but you can do a lot of things just to, you know, change the numbers and everything, but. Um, so I think when you find those those fake it till you make it attitude, that, then that's also a red flag for me. Sounds good. I hope that answers your question, uh, Salman. Uh, let's turn to Jafar now. Yeah, his question, Jafar Hussain. His question is that what is investors' approach towards startups in emerging economies, which are working on solving more of global problems? than just regional problems. So if uh, a startup comes to you with a proposition which has not just uh, the uh, focus of solving a problem within the country, but also more regional in, or international, then what's your typical approach when you see such a deck or such a pitch? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think I've experienced this so many times. Um, what I would say is that what would be their competitive advantage, right? Because when you when you're, for example, let's say you're Tokopedia or or Gojek, you can dominate the market. You can dominate Indonesia market because you you focus on Indonesia and and, and Uber try try to come into Indonesia, but uh, because you have that competitive advantage being local, understanding the market, um, Uber ended up leaving the country, right? So I think when you're saying that you wanna tackle the global market, essentially you're, you're saying that those global players are also your competitors, right? Then what would be your advantage uh, right now compared to them? Uh, do you have like, uh, I don't know, PhD in behavioral science or PhD in, 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 in um, computer science or, or robotics or what, what not that would make you different than someone in Silicon Valley trying to do the same, right? Because when you're trying to attack the same market, essentially you're competing, competing against the, you know, for the, um, if you're doing blockchain, then you're competing with the, the private Russians or Estonians and, um, and also Silicon Valley people. So I, I think um, competitive advantage would be something that I would discuss a lot with the, the founders. And if you're talking about Indonesian market, definitely then local knowledge, uh, understanding of the market, would be a very advantage. Um, that would be a great advantage compared to someone in 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 Silicon Valley trying to attack the initial market. But yeah, you got what, what I mean, right? Uh, thank you, Arya. We only have 40 minutes left here, so I'll try to rush through a few of the other questions. Ms. Han asks uh, about the sectors or industries that you think will grow in the next three to five years. You did. Uh, allude to this question uh, question earlier when you were presenting your slides and you said that this year or the next year will probably be the year for the API. But would you like to elaborate more on what you're seeing as a trend in the emerging markets? Let's focus on the emerging markets and what's your thought about the next three to five years? Yeah, so um, of course the trend of the O2O that I mentioned earlier, is not gonna stop in, in, in 2021, right? It's just that um, you know, just like the e-commerce are still there, fintech are still there, it just builds up, you know, more on top of it. It's just like the, the, the new uh, hot topics. So definitely what I saw, even in Indonesia, the, the biggest problem is education, logistics, and healthcare. Those are still the, the, main, the main topics and, and the, what um, we like so far. And logistics, Right now, it's really hot in Indonesia where we've got a lot of funding for logistics because the supply chain, the you know, the infrastructure in Indonesia are not that great yet. And 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 you would need that first mile, uh, warehousing, last mile, all this 
supply chain would be very tough to create if you don't have a lot of money, if you don't have a lot of uh, capex needed just to build that infrastructure. So, like, so far, it's, it's been a hot industry so far in Indonesia. I don't know in Pakistan, but I, I would guess once the, the e-commerce are booming, the, um, you know, telemedicine, you know, delivering medicine online, deliver, delivering food online, this will definitely impact the, the logistic supply chain ecosystem. Thank you, Arya. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for your message on the site. Um, Junaid asks a question about the digital payment systems uh, in Indonesia and how easy and conducive it is from a regulatory perspective. I mean, are there regulatory frameworks in place to uh, make it easy for the digital payment systems to flourish? Yeah, so I would say the, some of the winners of this digital payment are the ones actually started to look on that in that space before there was even regulation, right? Um, so being the first, and, and I, I guess have to understand the, 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 the problems, the, what needs to be done within that um, framework is, is really what you need to do because, because some of those earliest uh, players are actually the ones um, discussing and uh, discuss with, with, the, with the government to set the regulation. So um, I would say the regulations are built to accommodate the, 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 the fintech, the, the, uh, all this, this new payment regulation. So of course you, you will have the, what we call here OJK, the, the regulation body for, for, for uh, financial um, companies. It also regulates banks and everything, but they created a sandbox, you know, they created a sandbox where a lot of the payment, peer-to-peer -peer lending and everything they can sign up and be in that sandbox. Um, meanwhile, they, they start to think about what's the, the proper regulation that they can uh, deploy. So uh, if that sandbox or the regulation is not there yet in Pakistan, I would say being the first player in the, in the, in the industry is beneficial because the regulatory people would, would definitely, the, the regulators will definitely ask your opinion about it, right? So I think uh, that's what happened in Indonesia. And, and if, ha if it hasn't happened yet in Pakistan, then be the first in line. Certainly, thank you. Um, there's a question of more, it's more of a tactical question about how you uh, calculate the TAM uh, for a SaaS business. Um, do you have any pointers that you give to the entrepreneurs? Uh, yeah, so usually, of course, the unit economics has to make sense, right? Yeah, of course, the, 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 when I invest in, in, in SaaS, uh, I don't invest in free product, right? So I, I invest in, in companies that already have um, tractions in, in the first place with real customers, you know, not fake, um, not fake customers, so real customers. And so basically, I, uh, we can try to quantify the unit economics, you know, uh, and also the, the sales process and everything. So we, we can kind of like quantify the, the customer acquisition cost as well. Um, for the LTV, the lifetime value, it's tough when it's quite early because you cannot quantify the churn rate yet let's say one year or so. So um, you have a lot of assumptions um, going in there. But you know, when, when you're talking about the, the total decimal market, uh, what I like to do is to discuss with the, the founders and, and ask him or her, who's the, the type of users that will use this kind of product, right? And really do the, the bottom-up approach of doing the market sizing. 
rather than just taking what whatever is on the survey or whatever saying the, the, the market of this let's say construction is this um, what we would try to do is that the survey but you know the, the number the survey of let's say the number of companies uh, with only 20 people in in let's say the construction for telecommunication in my industry right so how many construction companies are actually specializing in in telecommunication you know those number of companies would i would say more useful in terms of trying to do the market sizing because that would be the whatever the market is right now and, and just if let's say my company is willing to pay for you know 500 bucks you know and, and there are you know, one million of that company that would mean that would mean that, would mean that the, the market size is 500 million right so um that that's something that we usually try to do because a lot of the SaaS actually when when you do that do that market sizing you don't have actually a, a big market because you don't have that many companies that are willing to pay that much you know so um trying to the bottom bottom up market sizing is what we usually do uh, I would like to take two more questions before I, I ask you one last question from my side. Uh, this question comes from Andre Lukito, and his question is that, are you looking at any renewable infrastructure growth projects? And what are your thoughts of uh, such projects, um, especially from emerging and developing markets uh, in, in this coming decade? So, yeah, so Andre is my friend. So. Um... Thanks, Andre, for the question. Yeah, so I, I think, of course, renewable infrastructure is, is, is something that, that is, is in my, uh, my plan as well, because one of my investment, actually, it is not tech related, but we also have an investment in, in IPP company. Um, it's, a, it's a company, sorry, uh, in the independent um, power producer company, where we produce uh, power with mini hydro. So. Right now we have a 7.6 megawatt uh, mini hydro running in Java and also in, in, in Sulawesi as well, 10, 10 megawatt. So I, I'm a big believer in, in, in renewable infrastructure, um, but there's always a but, right? Because the, we depend a lot on the government regulation and the regulation keeps changing and everything. So I think the stability on the, the regulation for this renewable uh, infrastructure is really important because um, it's a long-term investment, right? You can't have, you cannot commit to invest in something and then suddenly the, the uh, regulation change again. So I think the stability in terms of the regulation is really important before we start to invest in renewable. Certainly. And last question uh, from the uh, chat here is from uh, Reno Rinaldi. And he asked the question that what was your proudest moment in terms of an investment decision that you made thus far? <laughs> so, um, yeah, Reno is also my, my good my friend as well. <laughs> so um, I'm not gonna single out one you know, company because I think it's not fair. Um, but I, I, I would point out my, my proudest moment in terms of my journey so far is that um, I was able to learn a lot of things, right? Because when you meet with a lot of great founders, you would discuss a lot of things that is really beyond my knowledge, right? I guess something that, that I never imagined that I can implement in my company. I can actually learn it from from these founders, and and this opportunity meeting with great founders is really something that I uh, I'm thankful enough, and and it uh, it makes the 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 job easier, right? Because you, when you meet found with the founders and you actually learn something from them, uh, it makes it really um, what do you call it uh, uh, rewarding. Very nice. Thank you so much, uh, Arya. Um, I. I just have a question and it's kind of a question and proposition uh, baked together for you. Um, 
we we should do more of this these these sessions, man. And I think one one way to do this is maybe in a few months, as you learn more about this of about Pakistan, and, and I'll keep sending you data. Maybe we can have more investors from Indonesia, uh, and and the your friends in the VC ecosystem there, kind of do a uh, a panel where you and I can be the uh, can be the moderators, and you can kind of have uh, more of uh, the Indonesian ecosystems and its venture capitalists and uh, some of the more successful founders come in and we can we can have a hour long session where we can ask them questions. And I'm very sure that the um, entrepreneurs and the, uh, uh, the investors and those who are thinking of investing or starting a business in Pakistan uh, would benefit from such a session. Um, I really appreciate and thank you for your time. I know we we had an exam. In fact, I actually have to give my exam right after this <laughs> this uh, this session here. So I really appreciate your time. I hope you did well in the exam last night. Um, yes, thank you so much. And uh, I'll be in touch afterwards with some more data. Any any uh, final thoughts or uh, comments from you? No, no. So I think uh, thank you so much for 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 this uh, opportunity. And and actually, it makes me more more interested to learn more about pakistan because i think it's, it's going to be the next um, the next big country that will flourish as well no definitely as as hopefully this uh, covid 19 subsides um, you know we'll 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 make a plan to kind of visit to, to have a visit for for you in pakistan and i'll be your host there and of course we already have plans to visit indonesia so Looking forward to see you very soon, my friend. Uh, st be safe, stay in touch. I hope your family is well, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Th thank you for. All right, man. Thank All you, right. everyone. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, everyone, thank you for your time. Uh, have a good rest of the day, wherever you are. Assalamualaikum.